Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, back from the hospital where I had my multiple sclerosis treatment, and now I just feel terrific. Well, I mean, I don't feel worse. And that's a victory when you have multiple sclerosis, but that's not the point. I'm here to talk to you about death. You got it death. Because a bunch of you have said things about the fact that James Levine recently passed away, which was a sad thing if you were part of the family of James Levine or maybe James Levine personally. But I want to say something about artist obituaries and why I don't do them for the most part. Let's start with the very basics, shall we? They're depressing. They're really depressing. And most of the time, most of the time, you don't really have anything to say. <laughs> I mean, you know, so-and-so's dead. That's the obituary. The rest of it is all stuff we already know from other places. We know their work. We know the recordings. Probably some of us know the basics of their lives. We know where they worked. We know the things that they did that mattered to us. So how does the fact that they're dead matter to us? It doesn't. They're dead. Their work survives. It's there. We can enjoy it. That's the first reason. The second reason is... I don't really, I'm not interested in death, especially the death of artists. I mean, I had an uncle, my uncle Nate. He died about two years ago. He was a great guy, just a great guy, beloved of everybody. He was everybody's uncle Nate. You know what I mean? He wasn't married. He was just beloved, absolutely beloved. His death was sad. I could do an obituary right now for my Uncle Nate. In fact, I spoke at his funeral. I speak at a lot of people's funerals if they're family members. I know how to do this sort of thing. I really do. But James Levine? What could I possibly say about James Levine? I didn't know him. He wasn't my friend. I had no personal interest in him. So uh, the rest of it is just reportage and, and dreary reportage at that. The other thing is that obituaries tend to spend a lot of time on non-musical things. In fact, they're mostly about non-music. You know, in Levine's case, you talk about, well, he was at the Met forever, and then he got embroiled in these horrible sexual scandals, which were the best not kept secret in all of classical music because everybody knew about it. And it was only because, you know, the, the, the world woke up with the Me Too movement that it started to matter. Okay, we know all that. There's the obituary, right? No, the real reason is that you wind up spending a lot of time talking about useless biographical detail. And those biographies tend to all be the same. If you look at your Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, let's, let's like, for example, let's pick a, your typical English artist. You know, I mean, you know, Sir, Sir Edward Thistlethwaite, the violinist. Famous, famous violinist. Everybody knows him. He was one of the first people to play the Elgar Concerto upside down. All right? And the biography always begins the same. It's, a frail child, Sir Thistlethwaite, or whatever his first name was, I've already forgotten it, call it Reginald. Sir Reginald Thistlethwaite was a frail child who was educated at home by unmusical parents. Fortunately, his nanny was a former sewing machine operator and violinist who taught him the rudiments of music while, whilst, pardon me, whilst he was taking his lessons in astronomy. At an early age, he deemed it to his parents' great disapproval that music was to be his career. And so he acceded to the Royal Academy of Violinicity, where he became an outstanding exponent of the underbody of the violin repertoire. And so on, and so on, and so on. That's the English guy. And then, if the artist was French, it goes, it goes something like this, I would think. Madame Juliette de Foie Gras was the love child of a poetess, Juliette Crevette Meunier, and her father, well, we don't really know what her father was. In fact, we don't really know who her father was. However, she grew up in an artistic environment where her brilliant virtuosity on the organ was encouraged 
by her artistic parents and the wonderful community of demi mondaines who circulated around the local home in the in the Les Halles neighborhood of Paris and etc. I mean you get it, it's gonna go on from there. And then she went on to be famous. Okay, and she died. Next, say the guy's Italian. He's Italian, he's a tenor, right? He's a tenor. He's got to be a tenor. He absolutely has to be a tenor. His 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 name is 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 Cavatelli Putanesca, the famous tenor Cavatello. He's a guy, and there's only one of him. Cavatello Putanesca, you know, was discovered. His magnificent voice was discovered whilst he was working in a fish market in Apulia because he came from a family of fisher folk and he was he was singing to a sea bass that he'd re recently caught and his incredible voice caught the ear of a traveling empresario who took him up and although completely illiterate musically trained him to become the tenor we all know and love who has conquered the world's opera houses singing Andrea Chenier all right we got that one and then, of course, if it's a composer, he was probably German. You know, German was, you know, uh, well, you know, come up with come up with a name. Help me out here, folks. You know, how about how about Ignaz Brautschleimer? I've used that name before, but it was a good one. Ignaz Brautschleimer was the son of humble tradespeople in Thuringia. His father was a shoe salesman, and his mother was a a book my book book mender she mended books and the two of them were tremendously artistic and encouraged their son's artistic pursuits he went to the hochschule for musik in berlin where he was trained by some pedant and became the famous conductor we all know and love who specialized particularly in the music of Bruckner. Yes. Okay. So that's the biography, right? We've done these things a million, million, billion times. Now, if we're lucky, it could be like James Levine. They could have had some tremendous sexual scandal or something interesting, something worth reading. Perhaps they got caught up in a war. They could have been half Jewish and they fled the Nazis. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of juicy tidbits that might, that might enrich the biography of a dead person. But again, Go read a book. That's what you want to do. The real reason, the ultimate reason, the most important reason I don't do these musical obituaries is because they're not musical. They really have nothing to do with music. And take James Levine. He's an excellent example. He recorded tons and tons of stuff. Most of those recordings exist. exist. Anybody can go listen to them. That's his life's work. It's available. It's absolutely available. And to the extent it isn't available, he doesn't need an obituary. He needs an addition. DG, RCA, EMI, <laughs> Sony, whoever. That's what he needs. If you really care about the man, put together a big box with all of his stuff in it and issue it. And then we can talk about the music. We can talk about his work. There are certain artists, I admit this freely, who are important. Most artists don't matter. Don't get me wrong here. Most don't. I mean, if somebody like Levine, good as he was, had, had never existed, would we be remarkably impoverished musically? I would say no, because mostly he conducted things that everybody else conducted. And that was true of most artists. They play music in the classical world. They play music that everyone else plays. They're not creators. Composers matter. I really believe this. Composers matter, at least dead, but the, the composers, composers also don't matter until they've been dead for a while. So they don't get obituaries either, usually, usually. But the fact of the matter is composers matter because they create the stuff that artists do. Artists can matter. Some of them really matter. Maria Callas, she mattered. Charles McCarris, he mattered. He brought us Janicek. He brought us a period instrument handle. He brought us all kinds of music that other people were not playing. Those kinds of artists matter. The artists who own a repertoire and and revive it or tell us how important it's become. That doesn't mean they were great artists. 
you know, Christopher Hogwood was an important artist. He revived a ton of music. Was he somebody who I think uh, he deserved an obituary? Does he deserve a box? Well, <laughs> you know, Roger Norrington definitely doesn't deserve a box. I'd be delighted to do his obituary. It's, it's a, it's a obviously subjective thing. It truly is. But I, I just feel that somebody like James Levine or any of these big name conductors who run around doing the same stuff everybody else is doing, either their work will survive because of its excellence and its popularity, or it won't. So who needs the obituary? What's the point? They're gone. The records are here. Do an addition. George Zell, case in point, right? His work has survived. Who needs a George Zell obituary? We have the box. We'll listen to the box. I just find them so dull, so unnecessary, especially in the world of the arts. These guys have to stand or fall on the merits of their work, their biographies, their lives, their thoughts. Oh my God, their thoughts interest me not a bit, not the teeniest bit. So that, in a nutshell, is the reason I just don't want to do biographies. I don't care. I really don't care. I would much rather play the music. I would much rather keep on listening. Isn't that the point of this whole thing? And if we admire them and if we like them, we will be talking about them. We'll be talking about them as if they're still alive. We can eulogize them in perpetuity by praising their work and by listening to their work. And there's absolutely no reason just because somebody dies that they need a speech from me. Let other people do it. Thank you for listening. Take care.